look at rib cage position, anterior pelvic tilt, stacking the rib cage, and all this sort of stuff. They have their place. But then when you look at that, this obviously depends on the fact that we don't have an X-ray. To be an online coach, you have to be a really good one-to-one -one coach first. Unless they're, you know, perfectly limbed and have perfect joint angles to front squat, then um, they're probably never going to get there. Um, all the resistant curves, strength profiles being matched, etc. Who knows what that does long term? So, Steve, another another episode. We've got one more to go with the fat loss one that we recorded last week, which will go out live on Monday. And now I wanted now to delve a little bit deeper and talk about exercise mechanics because it is the buzzword in the industry. Sounds and good. What I've realized to open the show, what I've realized for like two, three years ago, mechanics was only the muscle mechanics crowd. It was the moment arms, it was the daisy chains, it was the resistance profiles. And what I've started to notice recently, and I think the, the Pat Davidson crowd has, has, has come into this, and, and Pat's great and he understands his mechanics really well, but again, it filters down, is the functional biomechanics crowd has become louder. The people that talk about gait and ribcage expansion and structural balance and all these other things. So what I've come to learn in anything is that the answer always lies somewhere in the middle. So from your perspective, from your training, from your masters and like much deeper level of um, traditional education than me, what importance do you feel there is in each side of that coin? I think there's obviously a lot of importance on both sides. I think um, mm. first and foremost, whatever side you tend to gravitate towards that will be based off your own experience and education and skill set, right? And the client that is present, you know, um, when you're more versed on both sides and you can take bits of both and apply what you need to apply, whether that's breathing, structural balance, um, you know, exercise variations to hit specific muscle groups, if that's the goal or whatever, you know what I mean? So um, all areas are valid and important. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I tend to always focus on a few things. And we've, I've mentioned it before, dynamic correspondence, which mm -hmm. is a set of rules or principles, which when you have your goal, your individual, your athlete, your client working on building muscle or fat loss, you then try and fit their programming into these criteria, actually, of what they are, their five criteria. And then you will be able to program and make you know your your program based off those and those there's five of those and those are you have um you, you select your exercises based on the the rate and the time available so um you know meaning more exercise specific okay mm. the the regime of muscular work so what sort of muscular work do you want to use the direction that you want to train so you could train vertical horizontal you know or frontal etc and the dynamics of the effort mm. so i think like i i like that there was four there's one more region of accentuated work as well so like I, I try and use those that framework to guide my template of training but other people will take those other areas i think what's important is that um you have a reason for doing it like anything and you're assessing you're not just guessing, you're assessing the individual. If you feel like they need to work on rib cage positioning because you've done these tests and assessments, then that's fine. Go for it. You know what I mean? So what do you think about that sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, like, I think I think everything has its place. The problem I find a lot of times is that we're, we're increasingly, in the world in general, but it's in the fitness industry massively, that where we, we appeal a lot of people hear sound bites, right? So yeah. if we look at both of those sides of the coin, right? We have the people who are more um, teach the muscular mechanics style stuff, let's say. And that's your Tom Purvis, your Michael Gordon. Now, at no point do I think either of those two don't understand the other side of the coin. They understand mechanics. A good person with biomechanics uses all of these tools, right? But what right. you find is that people find their mentor. And if Tom Purvis is here and Michael Gordon's here, or I think Michael Gordon might even be, you know, he would say he's below Tom Purvis, but whatever. You have the people there that learn that, the people that learn off them, the people that learn off them, and those people at the bottom aren't really applying it well or don't know how to, if something doesn't fit to the mold, doesn't fit to the model, because it's not their model, it's someone else's model, they don't know how to apply something different. 
On the other side of the coin, you've got Bill Hartman and you've got Pat Davidson. Really clever guys. But the people that learn it three or four levels down don't understand what's going on with ribcage gate positioning as well as these people. So the application isn't quite there. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I think that's a big, big thing, like, you know, understanding the actual principle and knowing how to apply it is important. But I mean, you learn that with, you know, the amount of experience you have and understanding it at a specific level, right? And then mm. practicing and applying it. So I suppose everyone goes through that process of learning. Yeah, I think and you brought up a really important point there is that people having to understand the why. If you have an understanding of why they are doing something, um, that's the important thing. Because so many people don't understand a why on their program. Your why may develop over time as you start to learn and understand these concepts more. But a lot of people do stuff. A why should never be because Bill Hartman does it or because Pat Davidson does it. You have to, A why could literally mean it's an exercise I know I can train hard. It's an exercise I can coach really well. That can be your why to start with. But you have to have a why that's personal to you and your coaching. Yeah, and if correct, you have yeah. that, it doesn't matter how advanced it is. But that's why when I went to coaches, I always go, I don't mind what your program says if you can give me a rationale why, whether I agree yeah. with you or disagree with you. Yeah, totally. I agree. Uh, rationale is really important. You should always have an evidence-based approach, but that doesn't always mean just it needs to be scientifically proven and validated. Uh, evidence-based approach can be from your experience or from someone else's experience. Um, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I think, um, when you say your why, I like to say your philosophy, you know, what's your philosophy? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I totally agree with that. I, one, I was saying this to Rob the other day, it's like, like I'm building out this trainer education, uh, mentorship at the yeah. moment. And my second lecture is mastering your system. So I have my reset, rebuild, replenish system, and yep. then I'm going to help people learn their own. And the reason why I think that's so important is because I went to so many calls over the years. I had no idea how to apply any of it because I was like, it's just noise. Whereas now I can go, that's good. And it fits in here. That's good, but it's not relevant to how I work as a coach. So yeah. it's going to be a tool for another time. Well, that's rubbish. And I can now explain why I think it's rubbish. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, totally. With, um, with your five things that you base your exercises off, you mentioned direction of force. What directions do you think are important to train it? Because when we look at the bodybuilding, it's always sagittal plane. So is, like, are you primarily looking at sagittal plane? Do some movements have more importance in a program than others? What are you looking at? What directions are you basing your exercises on? Well, when it comes from like a fat loss and building muscle perspective, it's not that essential, right? Mm -hmm. If you know, but we do like to say, you know, split the, the training days into a vertical push or a horizontal push day or whatnot to make things easier to program and, and structure. Like <clears throat> I'm sure you've heard of the force vector theory. <clears throat> um, and I mean, it was popularized by Brett Contreras with his studies on the hip thrust. Now I think, um, for example, like, first of all, that, that, force vector theory do you want to define it for people that might not know what it is listen to this um it's basically you know taking an exercise and saying this is a horizontal movement that means it will transfer to a horizontal movement okay mm. a vertical movement let's just take a if you have to do like I'll, I'll take it from an athletic standpoint if you need to produce a if you need to jump high if you're a high jumper you should be doing squatting because it's the same movement pattern okay it's the same force vector mm. and brett Contreras says that you know doing hip thrusts because of the movement pattern will transfer to sprinting because they're moving horizontally okay and the hips mm. are moving horizontally has a greater transfer okay then squatting for example does that make sense yeah it makes sense but i wouldn't i would argue that most movements in the body arc. So if you look Correct. at the movement that hits through sprinting is yep. not entirely a horizontal movement. There are points yep. where it's horizontal. There are points where it's vertical. Most yep. things arc. The shoulder arcs, the hip arcs. So would that ruin that theory? Or is there totally, yeah. There's a lot of, there's, there's huge errors with the force vector theory because 
first of all, the name force vector theory force is actually a th force is actually a vector. Mm. So to call it force vector doesn't make sense. So what's the theory? So it's just a stupid <laughs> name. Yeah. Um, maybe, yeah, they should have called it something else. Um, mm. And then the, like Contreras and a lot of other people that believe about the force vector theory and use it in their work, they, they don't understand the core, some, what's called the coordinate system. And you have okay. the local, the local system, which is the human body. Then you have the global system, which is gravity in the world. Mm. So the easiest way to understand it is, well, actually when you're sprinting, you, you locally, the person is moving horizontally, mm -hmm. right? But for them to travel horizontally, they have to apply vertical force. So they're not pushing this way to go that way. They're pushing this way to go that way. So there's mm -hmm. actually more vertical forces. So to say this exercise transfers to, this is a horizontal exercise, it transferred to this horizontal movement. They're just thinking about the local system of the human body and how it's moving. They're not thinking yeah. about the gravity and the earth, the global coordinate system. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? hundred percent. And it also like, if you, if you're looking at that in terms of like de delving deep into exercise, you wouldn't, if, if that was true, you also wouldn't be able to have a resultant in anything. So me doing a hip thrust, use the barbell hip thrust for an example, there wouldn't be a difference in me driving my feet away from the bar in towards the bar, pushing my feet out. There'll be a resultant from the line of force, the effects of gravity, from my intent will actually create slightly different things in, in no matter how I do it. Yeah. And, and this is where, why I use dynamic correspondence and those criteria, mm. because if you think about some of those five criteria, like the hip thrust is a great exercise, but to say that it only works because of this and it will improve because of this one thing is silly because there's a lot of other variables that will account for improving someone, whether that's muscle hypertrophy, etc. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I get that. So when you're like, so does that mean when you're looking at movements in terms of direction of force, is if, if someone's looking to train with you to improve muscularity and bodybuilding, would you remain mainly in the sagittal plane? Because that is the goal mainly, or would you balance that out with, because this, because a lot of people always say like, you know, when someone's a structural balance and we'll get into different meanings of structural balance. I think every coach has a different meaning. We like, well, we've got to be able to move in the transverse plane. We've got to move in the frontal plane because we've got to get out of this sagittal. Is that a problem? If the goal of what they're trying to do is sagittal, if they're not a athlete that needs to go side to side, for example. No, I don't, I don't think it's essential to delve into all those um, areas when the goal is solely to build muscle or lose body fat. Like, will it make you more of a, will it make you more of a complete athlete? An overall better mover, yes. But if the goal is just to build muscle, then you need to do what's going to maximize muscle, which we discussed on previous podcasts, which is, mm -hmm. you know, muscle <clears throat> tension, mechanical tension, and the rest. So um, working in those other planes won't maximize that as much as well. So, um, I mean, you might want to delve also into define, it. Define athlete. Yeah. The thing there is also define athlete, right? It exactly, might make yeah. you a well-rounded, better athlete, but depends what it is. M what my need to be a better athlete as a, like, as a, a I said this kind of thing with a client today and we talk about this structural balance. It's like, he's getting into a lot of like, I need to do loads of stretching and mobility. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I was like, just be aware, mobility and stability are the other ends of these continuum, right? So most of us should fall somewhere between mobile and stability. We don't, being overly mobile isn't a good thing. And it's dependent on what we want to be. I played rugby for so many years. I got smacked a lot, right? So I've fallen down the stability side of this continuum. Now, right, because of that, right? And well, because of that and many other things, right? I've not, I've not always trained smart most of my life. I've, I've done a lot of mistakes that have fucked me up. But I'm probably close to the stability side of this. You know this. I don't move very well. I'm not very mobile. But I don't get injured much. I've barely broken anything. Now, if we take somebody like, a, like if I wanted to be a ballet dancer, as a powerlifter, this is good. They're the stablest people on the planet. They move in small range of motion through a sagittal plane. They need to be really stable and locked in, right? 
But yeah. a ballet dancer or a gymnast, that's not great. But on the flip side of that, while being mobile is good for the ballet dancer, ballet dancers get hurt a lot. Why? Because the more mobile you are in general, the less stable you are. So this, it, this, this is a continuum. When we're looking at what an athlete is, there's, there's danger in sound bites of got to improve your mobility, got to improve your stability. Do you? What's the goal? What's the output? Is, is more yeah. mobility a good thing here? If you're a boxer, eh, as long as you can throw a punch out in front, I want to be pretty stable. So yeah, I'm going to get true. smacked. Yeah. You know? I mean, um, what would you define as an athlete then? If you had to put a term on it. It's a really good question because athletes... If I had to define an athlete, it'd be someone that plays sport to a high level or profession. I don't think when you, I don't think athlete, the a definition of athlete combines with the definition yeah. of fitness because <clears throat> the demands of sports will be entirely different. So you can get a thousand athletes and have a thousand different things you need to do. With yeah, totally. You work with more athletes than me. So how would you define it? Um, to me, an athlete is someone who needs to be able to produce a certain amount of force in a specific given time frame to compete, win, contribute to a team and get the better of their opponent or whatever sport mm. they're playing. Like, that, yeah. to me, that's it. And there's many ways to do those things. Hmm. I'll give you another hmm. definition. Moving on from this, can we sort of going into it a little bit? How would you define, or what does it mean to you to achieve structural balance? My view on this has changed a lot over the last few years, you know? Hmm. I used to be very poliquin focused and structural balance means to have specific ratios between certain muscle groups and you know, stabilizing muscle groups, etc. 10% of your bench press is your external rotation. Yeah. Good luck. I mean, it's a great framework. Can you see me right with this light? Mate, you're all, all, all good. All good. Your Wi-Fi is chopping in that a little bit, but it's, it's, it'll be good on the recording. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, yours is as well, actually. Um, mm. It's probably mine, though. You know, like, I, you see know. The, I see the value in working on muscle groups that you may test and find weak, mm. but trying to bring them up to a specific percentage, I found over the years of trialing it, it doesn't work too well. Now, you know, is someone going to squat 85% of their back squat on a front squat? You may want to strive for that. But realistically, unless they're, you know, perfectly limbed and have perfect joint angles to front squat, then um, they're probably never going to get there. Um, same as the bench presser, you know, someone's not built to bench press. They're never going to get between that certain percentage of what they can overhead press and chin. Um, mm. You know what I mean? So, um, And that's where the lot- difference is between... That's where the difference is between some of the, the people that go down the wormhole of sort of like performance mechanics and movement mechanics, as opposed to people that go down the muscle mechanics crowd. Like that structural balance stuff is what a lot of people look at. They look at rib cage position, anterior pelvic tilt, stacking the rib cage and all this sort of stuff. They have their place. But then when you look at that, this obviously depends on the fact that we don't have an x-ray and we can't see what someone's structure's like. If they have bone spurs, if they've broken their ankles seven or eight times, right? They're not gonna be able to get that dorsiflexion or, uh, to, do, to do some of these lifts. And when we're looking at the structural balance sheet, someone that's seven foot three will not back squat what they can do, de- like a percentage of the deadlift that you expect, but someone that's short may way outdo their squat from their deadlift. Yeah, totally. And this is where some of these things, I think it's, it has their place, these graphs, because the graphs will, um, I think they have their place, these graphs, because the graphs will also give mentally a client a goal to shoot for but i think it's more mental than actually has logistical aims yeah i think so yeah i mean um what sort of other structural balance sort of stuff have you looked at and used um a lot of the stuff i've, I've done a lot of the stuff like 
Bill Hartman, Pat Davidson stuff, and um, even a bit of Douglas Seal stuff, where you're looking at looking from that hip out, right? So a lot of the stuff is um, if you can't move through the diaphragm, which I kind of get, but I'll tell you what my my, my problems are with the, this sort of model. If you can't expand through the, the diaphragm well, you're not, your breathing mechanics aren't well, right? You're going to have a flared rib cage potentially. Now the diaphragm will then have the direct effect on the shoulder. So your thoracic won't move. Then all of a sudden your scapula can't move around the rib cage and all this sort of stuff. The diaphragm also has a fascial connection to the psoas. So that's now going to have an issue with the over lengthened of the hip flexor, which will then cause issues at the hip. You'll have this anterior tilt. And, if, and our body's always trying to keep ourselves over our center of mass, right? So if you have that anterior tilt, you're going to fall forwards. What you're going to need to do, you need to over, over flare the rib cage up so you to just keep balance and then you round forward at the top and that old upper cross, lower cross model. Now, I think this is a, a, a more advanced way of looking at that. And I kind of see it. I've seen it when you get somebody's hamstring strong, you get someone's glute strong, you, you allow the, get the obliques and the lower abs to work to pull the rib cage down. You see problems in the shoulder go away. You see problem at the foot go away. And I, I, I do believe this absolutely has its place. My problem with it a lot, especially with the breathing mechanics stuff, is that, one, structural balance. So not everybody needs an exact one-to-one -one ratio of strength in the chest to strength in the back. This is goal, going goal-dependent. And the second issue I have with it is the problem I have with breathwork drills. I use them. I think they're valuable. But I do think the amount of breaths we take in a day, if someone's got bad breathing mechanics, they're always going to do more bad reps than good reps. So it's like taking a piss in the ocean and trying to make it yellow. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I, what you, I agree. What do you think with things like that? Um, I use a lot of breath work with my clients. Um, but mostly for those who have sort of stressful lives, high tone, that mm. sort of stuff, it really helps them. Um, I don't use it directly for, you know, helping them bring their rib cage into positions i'd rather do other things to help that what would you do what would be your call well, what would be your approach well just more simple um just more more exercise based stuff you know like um your split squats your posterior chain work your lower abdominal work like you mentioned that sort of stuff and like yeah can we do that stuff with the rib cage in the right position can we breathe through the patterning yeah that that stuff's great but i i find just sitting there doing breathing drills is not a waste of time but yeah like you say you know you're you're you know it's a small portion of your day where you 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 know doing good breaths versus thousands of poor breaths i argue that the breath work stuff that's effective is actually effective because it calms the central nervous system more than it's effective yeah. because you actually change the way you breathe through your diaphragm yeah 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 and i think that's how i personally try and target um, the breath work, you know, can we use it to like, you know, change the nervous system? Mm. So like, let's talk about a little bit about anterior pelvic tilt and like stacking. We both mentioned this in the last little bit. Do you think anterior pelvic tilts need to be fixed? Do you think they are, pro they are problems? Um, no, you know, there's a lot of people that have them. There's a lot of people that have it and um, are they more prone to hip and groin and back injuries? Maybe. But if you can make them strong enough in that position, they may be okay to stay in that position because trying to fix something like that can be quite difficult. Um, you know what I mean? So um, you can try your best to get them into a perfect alignment and what you think is perfect but if they've spent their whole lives in that position it's very very difficult to get them out of it mm. so maybe the best strategy is to try but also make them really strong um you know in the areas that we know will be weak and lengthened um that's the kind of strategy that i go for i don't try and change too much um you know from how they look you know yeah I, I, I totally agree with that. I think I think there's one thing that I think a lot of coaches could do better, and, and I will include myself in this. I want to learn more about this. Is having a better ability to test this stuff, know what to look for, know what to see, because 
what I find a lot of times when people try and fix things, they try and be physios. I'm like, do you actually know that this client has that ability to even improve? So you don't waste time. Like, can you assess active range of the hip? My client can't squat past 90 degrees. I'm going to spend loads of time doing ankle mobility drills. And I'm going to stretch the quads out. I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm like, that could be where the, like, the femur hits the acetabulum, right? If that has happened, you're not going to stretch your way out of that. Kyphosis. Someone might have a curved spine. You're not going to stretch the pecs and that goes away. Mm. And I, I, I just want to make, when I look at people's programs, I'm like, I just don't want to waste their time. Most of them didn't come here, come to see me for improving their kyphosis. Most yeah. people come to see me because they want to get leaner and bigger. So what do I do? Find out where their active range is on the exercise. What's the range that they can control, own, safe, and work hard? I will work, 90% of what I do will be on those things. I may play around with pauses and try and make things a little bit better, but it's stuff that they can still do safely and then get the goal they want. I may give them some stuff to do on their own or stuff in the rest periods that may try and improve that. But if it does improve it, fantastic, because most of it's just the nervous system doesn't feel safe in a position, you get stronger there, things might improve. But if it doesn't, at least I'm not wasting time. At least I am where they are currently at. And um, I think that's that's something that a lot of coaches don't do because they want they don't want to refer out to people. They don't know how to test, so they just end up trying to do everything themselves yeah i think i think like testing assessing is really really important um you know like there, there's there's um when like there, there's something called skills and capacities now you know if you have someone that has never done an exercise before like a squat but surprise surprise you do get people that have never done a squat before um can you hear me okay yeah man got you okay yeah, yeah i've just gone blank off my screen there my video um you know, some people aren't going to be skillful at doing something. So some people, if they don't understand how to test a certain movement, then they may think that, oh, they just have tight hips or tight calves. When in fact, yeah. it's a skill issue, not a capacity issue. So a skill issue would mean, you know, they can't coordinate and skillfully do the exercise. Whereas if they have a capacity issue, they may lack strength, stability, control, like, um, you know, mobility, and things like that, then you can work on those capacity issues. But sometimes, especially with beginners, they just lack skill and the ability yeah. to move well in those positions. So you got to be very careful with, it's the same as like, you know, when you get people who are good movers, as you said before, they can move around like, you know, mm -hmm. positions and, and look good athletically when they do actually have a lot of capacity issues, right? but they're so skillful the way they move, they can make it look okay. Athletes are your best compensators, right? Athletes are your best compensators. And then the complete reverse is true. Like beginners, they may not have ankle problems and stiffness in their ankle or whatever. They're just very poor movers and not good at skillfully moving. So, you know, that's where you have to learn how to assess and test um, an individual. And it's why, you know, a combination of, active and passive range of motion tests are good and dynamic sort of movement exercises are good as well. So you can get a whole sort of look at everything. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I complete, I completely agree with that. And as I said, like the nervous systems, the reason why people get really sh so much stronger in the first two, three weeks of a program is because their nervous system is adapted there. So I might be able to go my knee over my toe, not because I lack ankle range of motion, but maybe just because I have never been there. So now even body weight, there's a load there. My body doesn't feel comfortable there. If I lie yeah, down on the floor, bring your ankle, bring your foot up to your shit, you may have tons of range. You just need to let the brain know I'm okay to use this. And yeah, sometimes and being that little bit patient yeah. can be hugely important. Yeah, and and I think it's about the first six weeks, maybe eight. It's mostly all central nervous system adaptations, anyway, with their training. So you know, clients, athletes, individuals, they need to give workouts time and trainers need to not just change especially beginners workouts too much mm. yeah I, I completely agree with that like like people often forget the skill side of training um and just like just for the sake of changing programs up i remember i was at seminar once where i saw someone do eight phases in a 12-week program and i'm like you just got into the grips with learning a certain lift and then you change it up like Get good at something, certainly early on, master a skill, and then if you want to progress it, progress it. But don't like run before you walk. 
I see coaches struggle with program design. Where do I go after week 12? And I used to be one of these coaches because there was a progression of exercise in every single phase. I'm like, well, well of course you've ran, you've ran out of phases. You progressed them too quick. And at some point you have to regress them right back because you just rushed that process. Yeah, totally. You yeah. can make like, always just make subtle changes. You know, like um, we mentioned before, like a front foot elevated split squat could be, um, you know, a contralateral or an ipsy lateral or a, a banded or a cable or put a belt around their waist, attach the cable to their waist. I love that one. Um, mm. You know, subtle variations on the exercise go a long, long way. And don't think it's boring that you're not, you know, completely changing it because the client doesn't care if you teach them and educate them why you're doing it. I think there's, there's two things to say about this, right? There is a, um, when a client gets aware that they're getting stronger, they see the numbers go up. They see them get stronger. They don't want to change the exercises. They don't want to progress. This is someone that doesn't know they're progressing, gets bored because they need to find novelty elsewhere. I also had um, a conversation with Johnny Jacobs, right? someone we both work for. Shout out to Johnny. And I was going through this problem early on in my career. And he said to me, he's like, Simon, when you want to change a program, is it that the clients are getting bored or is that you getting bored? And he went, think of it this way. You do a variation of that same style of programming five, six times a day, six days a week. That client does it once a week. And I was like, I, it's probably me changing for my novelty more yeah. than it is for the client's novelty. And I reckon a lot of trainers do that. Yeah, I agree. I think so. That's, that's totally, totally true. I think it's totally true. A unless you have an honest conversation with your client. Mm. I find with online, people need more novelty in their programming because they don't train maybe at the level that they would if they were with you. You keep things interesting in a program with your client because you can manipulate stuff. Yeah, I, I, I think so too, actually. Um, and like when you're one-to-one -one with someone, you can, it's a bit easier to explain and, um, you know, gauge their um, energy and their motivation and, you know, the attitude towards the workout, if you're keeping it the same or the program, et cetera. Um, whereas yeah. online, it's a lot more difficult to do that. So you, you really have to ask the right questions in your forms and with, in your consulting and really get to know the client. It's a lot more difficult. You can't gauge body language, et cetera, right? So, um, yeah, and it was another reason why, you know, everyone says it all the time is that to be an online coach, you have to be a really good one-to-one -one coach first so that you have the experience of program design, working with people, understanding psychology um, and these things. Because if you're not going into, uh, if you're going into working with online clients and you don't have that skill set behind you and that experience behind you, I think you'll really struggle to um, retain clients, understand clients, have empathy um, and understand what makes up a good um, program for someone that isn't coming to see you. Mm. And also have a good feel for the exercise. I have my clients that will say things yeah. like, split squats are easy. Can I do a tougher exercise? And I'm like, hold on, what? But you might, you might believe that if you've never spent enough time coaching people how to do proper split squats. Or you might see a video and think, that's fine, because it looks fine. But actually, you, you will be able to see the nuance. You'll be able to see falling for a three-second tempo and controlling for a three-second tempo. And that's an entirely different lift, even though it may look quite similar. Yeah, I, 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 it's important that you are experienced as a coach before you go into online coaching. Mm. So with, with that in mind, so we've, we've talked about assessments and obviously every program is going to be relatively individual to the bit persons, what they're coming to, what the limitations are, what the weaknesses are. But in general, rule of thumb, if you had like your 70, 80 percent of your population, is there things you tend to favor or bias in a program because you see it weaker in a lot of people, muscle groups, movements? things like this um i mean generally i like to have a variation of vertical pushes vertical pulls and horizontal pushes and horizontal pulls and then a hip hinge dominant movement and then a, a knee dominant movement if they can and that knee dominant movement doesn't always need to be just you know a squat it can be 
a step in variation, you know, like a mm. low step in variation with a high load or whatever. Um, but generally I like to make everyone overall strong in every movement pattern that they can do. You know, I don't tend to prioritize a horizontal push or a vertical pull or whatever. Um, I tend to just go for like a nice global um, approach. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very similar. I think when I'm looking at a beginner kind of program, the A's and B's, I'm doing like an, like an alternating workout. I will have a vertical push, a horizontal push, a vertical pull, a horizontal pull. Right, so now yeah. we get something that allows the scapula to move. Now we get something that can work in, like the scapula's moved to its full range. And then from the lower body, I will go hip extension, train the glutes, and the glutes are really important, so I might slightly prioritize them. Uh, a bilateral squatting pattern, that could be a squat, but it could also be a leg press. Um, yep. A unilateral squatting pattern, which could be a split squat, could be a step up, could be a lunge, depending on where the client's at. Um, so just get people opening up the hip, working through gates, that sort of stuff. Yep. And then I will have um, knee flexion um, as my eighth. And the knee flexion, yep. I think, is the most, this is where I, I, I think people underestimate. One of the undervalued things is training hamstrings. I think hamstrings help stabilize the pelvis and the knee so much. And in yes. turn, if we're going to put some weight in that model of improving hip position, improve shoulder position, the hamstrings and the glutes become such a key component. That I think yeah. knee flexion needs as big a priority as hip extension. I think a lot of people yeah. don't, don't prioritize it. And then I would start with those eight. And then as they become deeper into the program, I won't not need to do all of them. I start with all of them because most people need to be stronger in all of them. And then some maybe can become less of a priority. Some may become more of a priority as, as we focus focus in on stuff. But then I learn the individual problems rather than just assuming what the problems are going to be. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's little things over time that like coaches will, um, understand, like you say how important hamstring work is when you're working it from the knee flexion aspect. Um, I was in Ireland this week and, uh, someone invited me to their gym, bodybuilding gym. We did the deadlift workout. We started the workout with some line leg curls. So prone line leg curls on the, on the hammy machine. And we, we really locked in our trunk and our abdominals so that we weren't arching through the lower back. And when we did that, the other boys that I trained with, their load dropped by more than half, mm. you know, so training the knee flexors whilst the abdominals and the core was braced was way more effective. I said, said, oh, but I'm using less weight, but we're not using it to maximize the weight. We're using it as a warm up drill. So what we're using the exercise for, we're using get blood into the hamstrings before we do the deadlifts. Then mm. we did our deadlifts. Then we went and did more leg curls, but this time we went on the seated leg curl. So now we lengthen the muscle from the hip and at the knee. So understanding mechanics, understanding muscle attachments, etc., is really important for you to maximize your, your um, exercise selection. And then you can, you know, work on structural balance and these things a lot more easier. You know, you don't have to follow one approach. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the hamstrings are really interesting one to use in terms of that, in terms of the pelvis position. Because these are people that would probably lock their shoulder in place to do bicep curls, right? Because mm. if I lock my origin in place, that's the thing that generally shouldn't move, then I'd pull the insertion towards the origin. Yeah, and a hamstring curl, we see that all the time, that we're actually, people think they're shortening the hamstring, but what they're actually doing by flexing the hip and letting the spine go is actually lengthening it from the other side. In the set, it's the same reason why hamstrings aren't really much, don't really work in a squat. They don't lengthen or shorten. They just change at both ends. Um, and I think that's a that's that's the, one of the big eye openers when I work with coaches or clients is how a leg curl really should feel when you lock everything else in place. Yeah, it should be very very hard, especially if you have tight quads. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so, what last thing before we move on to the muscle mechanics crowd? You might know more about this than me, right? Because you've probably done a lot more force placey type stuff. What what do you feel the impact of gait is? And like how does the foot impact how we move through the hip, how we move through even further up the chain? Like how important is what we do when we walk and run? Yeah, so gait cycle is just walking and running, yeah, like your natural body movement. I think it's important. I think some people 
overkill it and go too deep into it. I mean, you know, a lot of issues do stem from the feet and then present themselves upwards. Um, generally, the biggest issue with people and their poor gait, in my opinion, is people who possess a very short gait, a short stride length. I think if people are walking with a very short stride length, mostly the elderly, older populations, or like yourself, if you have me. <laughs> you know, um, tightness around the hips, etc., then that will cause a lot of problems going forward. And it's something that needs to be addressed. Hmm. Other little things like a little bit of fucking foot pronation or whatever, who cares? You know what I mean? But, you know, if you're dealing with people that have really short stride lengths um, because of capacity issues, then that needs to certainly be addressed. Hmm. So... Just to close off on this this style of structural balance side of the conversation, I want to hear your take on this because we've obviously talked about this and there's things that personal trainers have had a great ability to help people get out of pain, move better, get stronger through end ranges, all this sort of stuff. But do you think there are too many trainers that try to be physios? Um, you know, the problem with me answering that is that I don't follow a lot of trainers and mm. coaches. I don't really look at what they're doing. But I do know people that, yeah, they try and be t too much physio based when they're just personal trainers. But I mean, physios are just as bad, right? They think that they know how to program, um, how to build muscle and strength and power and speed. Or even and worse, they're even worse, they try, you see physios that demonize training altogether. If you get an injury, stop going to the gym. That is the okay. stupidest thing you could ever do. I've had. I've had young lads that have um, damaged their spines and um, they go see the sports doctor, surgeons and shit, and they tell them no exercise for 12 weeks. All right, cool. No load in the spine for 12 weeks. It's obviously bad. The parent says, can he still work with his coach? Me. Yes, he can, but he's only allowed to sit on the bike and cycle. What? So I say, why? Well, he, he's not allowed to load his spine. He can only, only, this was what the surgeon said. He's mm. only allowed to go to the coach. Otherwise he's going to get bored. So just go it for, so, what kind of advice is that from a surgeon? He's also assumed that this client's going to get bored, I mean, which I don't mean, I mean, he would in terms of getting bored with cardio. But he's just, he's made this big assumption of what the personality of this client's like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's like, first of all, the surgeon has worked with high level athletes, the highest level athletes, but how poor is that advice and that recommendation? I don't care how bad the spine is. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. So what we can't do, um, so what we can't do like certain upper body exercises, like flat presses and incline presses and leg curls. extensions. Leg extensions, we what, we can't load the body. Um, you're telling him he can just jump on a bike and cycle? Anyway, I didn't do load with him for the first week. But then after that, I've, we've been doing everything normally. Um, it was fine. Yeah. You know. Well, they, call it, they call it structural integrity for a reason. Integrity being the key word, right? It, it, it's all well good being in a, a certain position, but that position needs to have integrity. We need to have safety there. We need to have stability there. And the problem we often find is that you get physios that will release something, which could, by the way, open up a can of worms because there might be a reason why your chest is tight. There might be a reason why your rec frame is tight. It's protecting you from something. And then the worst thing you can do is go, cool, don't do anything with that now. It's, it, it's going to go back to where it was before. You're not creating any integrity. You open something, you get stronger than new range. And, my, and I see this way too often. My sister-in-law... She, um, a couple of months ago, she had some sciatica. Hmm. Um, and then that then developed into like a lower back issue. Like I think more, the physio said it was like a facet joint issue. Um, she's had it for a few weeks, months, maybe. Um, I said, what did he do? What did he tell you to do? 
And she said, oh, he didn't give me any exercises. He just said to avoid deadlifts. Like, what kind of advice is that? I don't get it. Like a physiotherapist. That, that just doesn't make sense. That's like, again, you get a fat loss client come in and it's just like, I'm not losing weight. Okay, cool. Um, go on a calorie deficit. It's just, just throwing, like, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just pointless advice. I don't, I don't see why you would advise that. It doesn't make sense it's, to me. It's like, it's, it's, even at least that coach that says go on a calorie deficit is giving you something. Is that, is that physio wanting, wanting return business, thinking about his bank balance before he's thinking about his client. So you just come here and get adjusted every week for the rest of your life. And no one wants that. Yeah. It's, it's, except it's, the physio. Yeah. But at the same time, like <laughs> someone on the Facebook group, the PICP Poliquin fa Facebook group yesterday, I think it was yesterday, um, put a little post up about the physio that their client went to or the athlete went to. And then um, they said, um, oh, can he, he needs to do more agility, coordination and balance work. And everyone's like laughing at it. Like, oh, he's an idiot. But I, I said, like, why don't you ask him how he's assessing that? Why does he need to do that? But at the same time, you could do a few minutes of that and ain't going to harm him and it ain't going to affect your programming outcome. So why not? You know what I mean? Hmm. And the there, danger is in the dose. Exactly. Yeah. The danger is in the dose because there is some benefits to standing on one leg or balancing on a stability ball, there, um, a BOSU ball. There is some benefit to it. And if you do it as a warm up and preparation work, well, that's nothing wrong with it. That's what the physio wants you to do. Ask why. How do we assess it? How do we know that we're getting better? And then do a little bit. Why not? You know what I mean? Keep them happy. Keep the client happy. Move on. That's how I think about these things. You don't need to just say, oh, no, we're not doing that. That's stupid. Yeah, and that, I think that's the, the – when we're looking at the, the whole the, this whole mechanics thing, it's like what I want to avoid with the mechanics world, and I'm a big fan of exercise mechanics. I spend a lot of time studying it, is dogma, is, is be-all, end-all, one-size-fits-all approaches to stuff. In, in something that came out, the exercise mechanics world, especially in the, the more hypertrophy side of things, is all about being individual. But you see people never doing anything other than what they've been taught. And like, this is the counter opposite to what the people teaching you this are trying to do. They're trying to get you to this point where you look at everyone like an individual. You know how to program things for different purposes and different goals and different outcomes. But you now see people with 17 daisy chains and 466 bands on a chest press to make it match the strength profile. And like, that's not, that's not, that's not what you were taught. And it's just people not understanding the principles. Like, when it comes to that, do you think we should always aim to match strength profiles and resistance profiles? Uh, hell no. No, hell no. Hell no. No, not at all. I think, um, I think it's too much, you know? Like, if I can hell, you want to get strong, then you need to lift heavy weights. If you want to get strong mm. in the squat, you need to lift heavy weights and squat and do a, a balanced workout. Um, you know, Look at the strongest motherfuckers in the world. Yeah, powerlifters. There are powerlifters that do just squat, bench, and deadlift. And then there are powerlifters that do a lot of other things as well. Look at weightlifters, Olympic weightlifters. The Chinese weightlifters are the best in the world right now. They do thousands and thousands of exercise variations they even use bodybuilding methods in their training they do dips they do handstand push-ups they do crazy shit kettlebell rows and wacky wrestling movements they're the best weightlifters in the world <laughs> the bulgarians all they did was clean and jerk and snatch so <laughs> it's again it's people's philosophies and um everything works right Hmm. And I think it's, it's, it, this is where it depends on the goal, right? If your goals have a, a, a good squat bench deadlift, right? Squat and bench press in particular. But I would argue all of this, all of these exercises, they map, the resistance profile and the strength profile do not match. You're weakest in the bottom of the squat. The weight is heaviest at the bottom of the squat. That, in a sense, 
in this in this logic is done. The bench press is the same. That first third of the bench press is pretty redundant. Very little work. So you don't have to have much strength to do it. That's why people do half reps and stuff, right? So they don't match. But if your goal is to achieve strength on these things, you just got to understand that these things aren't going to match. And you've got to go, right, okay, what needs to be stronger? What needs to be stronger to allow me to get out of that bottom position? Now, let's flip this. If the goal is purely hypertrophy, then maybe there's an argument that you want more of a matching resistance and strength profiles because you want more constant tension throughout the lift to create more mechanical tension. So having a reverse banded Smith machine press where you're stable, you can lock in, you can create tension, you can push, you can make it slightly easier at the bottom so it gets really hard at the top. Excellent, right? That's maybe useful. But one, if you don't, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. I could do my bench press work for strength and then I can go on to where that reverse banded incline press as a B series for the hypertrophy side of this lift. And two, that if you don't have, if you if you're one can a confuse and don't have to set these things up properly, especially with band tension, or B, you you don't have the accessibility of some of this piece of equipment. It doesn't ha- like you don't have to match strength and resistance profiles in an exercise. Every exercise shouldn't be a math equation to make things perfect. If something's not matched properly, what can you do else in the workout? So if I want to challenge the, like to use the pec, I could do a dumbbell press, which isn't matched, but maybe I'll just do a cable fly that gets harder in this short position. They're not, both of those exercises aren't matched, but over the workout, I get the full end spectrum. But I think people have gone too far to make every exercise perfect. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Rather than trying to do an overall three things i'll just point out quickly the first one you mentioned about a squat right yeah it's the hard you'll get stuck in the bottom be in the hardest position but well, louis simmons says that um well he, sorry he said that the his strongest power lifters get stuck at the top as the, at that, that top range of motion so the stronger they are the more he finds they struggle locking out interesting all right. Why is that? Because not because because from a mechanical standpoint, you are considerably stronger, and the weight is considerably light. Like that, that at the top, there is no load, right? There's nothing. Exactly. Yeah, but they struggle more locking out. So maybe that's maybe that's a, a byproduct of their training system and the way they use their bands and the way they use their 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 different days of speed, etc. Maybe they are purely more hip dominant, and that's probably why they have small quads and big asses, mm-hmm. right? So maybe it's a product of the way they train over years. Secondly, all the resistant curves, strength profiles being matched, etc. who knows what that does long-term? Who knows what that can do long-term to you? Can it create imbalances long-term? Well, we don't know, right? If you do that all the time, it may create issues long-term, mm. right? And lastly, yeah. I'll just see all that stuff as exercise variations. Mm. They're just exercise yeah. variations that you can use, tweak, manipulate, um, to n- a novel stimulus, whether it's cluster training or a band or a, a reverse band, is simply just a novelty stimulus. And when you have a novelty stimulus, you'll be sore as fuck. You will um, most likely, if you do it correctly, recruit lots of high threshold muscle units because they haven't been taxed that way before but they're just variations and then then it's a novelty stimulus for you you can't Mm. do it all the time you need to change and vary yeah i from just going back to that louis simmons thing i think that's fine and interesting i presume here trying to give a a biomechanics understanding of why some people may find it harder in the top position i presume when he says the top position people are probably getting stuck just above the middle position. It's not like the last couple of inches. It's probably midpoint, right? So if you're now looking at people now that we talked about earlier on, like the hip being like an arc, even though you are weakest at the bottom, there may be a drop off in the load if you're coming out. And then as you come back in, there's probably a lot more butt winks because there's less, less of a consideration for that sort of stuff with Louis Simmons' training. That you are going to have the load's going to get heavier. There's going to be a bigger moment to like the hip and the quad. And then you drop back off as your hips now start to tuck back under. So you might find that hardest bit for these guys, and I I, I carry out what I should have said earlier on, is that Louis trains the best, trains the best of the best. So people self-select as good powerlifters, right? 
the seven foot four basketball players didn't end up at Louis Simmons gym. People end up being quite good at powerlifting because they're quite built for it. Go, do I should go and see Louis because I'm already good and I want to be better. You might find that these people are built for that position where like you can find it, it drops off at the bottom just by the way the mechanics lie. And as it gets that middle position, that now becomes where the weight is heaviest. And that's probably why they're sticking for it. That's, that's my two cents. Do you, would you agree with me? Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think he might actually mean like right at that top last third, you know, above that mid range position. Mm. You know? Um, I always find that me, I mean, I'm not crazy strong, but I always find that I, on the bench, for example, I never fail in the bottom or at mid range. I'll always fail at that, that last third at the top as well. But is that your, is your chest fat at the top or does your stability go at the top? Just overall strength. Hmm. Because I find mm. I lose it at the top quite a lot. But when I lose it at the top, it's more because my ability to stabilize the heavier load is the problem. It's the things mm. on the back. It's my scapular retracts. It's my mid traps. It's my, you know, rhomboids. These are things that are real adults. These are things that are failing as opposed to my chest. Because my chest, to do this, very little. Triceps, very little. They're going to be loaded a lot here. But I find here I might get a bit wobbly here, and that's why I start to lose. Well, that's the thing. Like, if if that's the case, and you use a lot of reverse bands on the Smith machine, that means that band will contribute to stability at the top position. Mm -hmm. Correct. What will that do? Uh, over well, you could argue that it wouldn't, right? Because a reverse band would actually like the band tension would completely drop off. So now, when let's say, say for argument, uh, let's say I'm struggling at 95 kilos on a bench, right? And I get here and I start to wobble. I now have a reverse band on, which means that because I'm supposed to be stronger here, I've now got more than 95 kilos here. And I've got probably the 95 kilos that I could push off my chest is, is now here. So I've only got 110 on the bar. It becomes 95 on my chest. And now I've got 110 in this top position. It could actually be more challenging in that top position now. Yeah, so now course, there's more load that I can actually handle in the top. Yeah, of course. That's correct. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. That's definitely so it actually correct. could actually, and that could either, that could either be a yeah. good thing because it yeah, could force you to stabilize to work harder, or it could mean that people are doing, it could be the eccentric chin up. Yes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, it's a super point. max at the top that we can't handle. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where load selection is important and understanding band tension. Um, mm. Yeah, and understanding okay. assessments, knowing where people are weak, because is is the reverse band for everybody? Not if that's the problem, maybe. Mm. Interesting. Maybe. You know, so I mean, I think it's um, it, I mean, it's it's such it's such a wor deep wormhole you can go down when it comes to those kind of things. But I generally think mm -hmm. it's like most people, like if you're training high level bodybuilders, where the goal is as much hypertrophy as possible, then maybe you're going to utilize more of these things. You're trying to match as many resistance profiles as possible because you're trying to get as few exercises and junk volume as you can to get as much amount of intensity to allow them to recover. If you're a training athlete, then you may go more the other way because they need to be strong at maybe at least certain lifts, maybe, certainly if you're powerlifting. But most of our clients, like, are just beginners wanting to put on a little bit of muscle. It's a mixture of the two. If you make it so bodybuilder hypertrophy, then they might not find it as quite as enjoyable because they're not progressing at a lift long term. They're not improving the skill of something because the skill's taken out of it by the accommodations. So you may want to put in something that allows them to be a reference point for strength, more the athletic power of the world, but then bulk the rest of the work up with as many reverse bands, daisy chains, machine work, cable laterizers as you want, because that's actually what they want. You know, like... That's what I said. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like while we're on this topic about exercises, let's talk about the force velocity curve. You heard of the force velocity curve. All right. Have so you have... again, for people listening that might not know, give it a quick run So the force velocity curve is basically you have a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. Now, the vertical axis will represent force. The vertical axis will, um, sorry, the horizontal axis will represent velocity. So they say that to improve, you need to work across this whole force velocity 
curve. So if you want to improve force, then you work on these top end exercises such as squats and deadlifts. And if you want to improve velocity and speed, you work on these exercises down in the bottom corner, which is more sprinting and throwing, etc. Now in the middle, you might have weightlifting, for example, okay, which is a combination of them both. So they say to improve maximal force, you need to squat. However, you could do weightlifting, which is categorized in the middle of this curve. And if you do a power clean, they're saying you, you, you'll improve power. However, if you do a power clean at the right weight, that can create more peak forces than the squat. And sprinting is velocity based. However, that can also create more peak forces than a squat. So, you know, you might select exercises thinking that it's working on peak force. However, you could just use sprinting to do the same thing. Mm. So sometimes there's these graphs and these templates out there in literature and what people think, but how you apply the exercise, the load that is selected will affect your outcome. Mm. Yeah. And I think if there's a lesson to take away from this episode, especially for the coach listening to this, is that everything needs to be goal dependent. Yeah. So whatever the demographic you work with, learn to get good at that demographic and learn what some, what tools yeah. from this toolbox are relevant with those kind of people. Some are going to be yeah. more relevant to others. When we look at hypertrophy, we're looking at creating talk, right? Talk four times moment. Now, that means there's going to be more relevance to some of this stuff to create as much talk as possible. But that might be different for someone that is a powerlifter whose goal is not to create as much mechanical tension as humanly possible, is to move weight through space as efficiently as you humanly can. So do you want a perfectly balanced resistance profile when the goal is to be efficient? Maybe not. So yeah. it's like, and it's a goal, and most people's goal falls in the middle. It's a continuum. I look at this as a continuum of like bodybuilding on one side. This is my, like my, my sort of gem pop continuum for training. Bodybuilding here on the left side, on the right hand side, I have powerlifting. The powerlifter probably would like to gain a little bit of muscle, but he doesn't really care as long as the bar moves up. The bodybuilder would probably love to get a bit stronger, but he doesn't care about getting a bit, a bit weaker as long as he looks bigger. The general population client falls somewhere in the middle of these two, where the goal might be closer to the bodybuilder, but they're they need to be, there's emotional connections to food and training that if they, if they feel they're not progressing, they just going to affect their action outside the gym and all yeah. these different things. Look at the goal, look at the individual, pick exercises based on what's going to mentally stimulate them, keep them coming back, train hard, and, and then put a bit of optimalness into their program design. Yeah, I think that's nice the way you... Optimal and practical are different. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's nice. That's good. So we'll call we'll call it there for our mechanics deep dive. But as always, Steve, where can where can people find find your work? I know you're currently on holiday and you're not gonna be you know as um on Instagram as you you normally are, but you are saying that the creative juices are flowing, so it's gonna happen soon. So where can people find well, all the new stuff that you start doing? Instagram, Facebook page, Stephen Collins Training. I'll be blog posting a lot more on the website soon as well, StephenCollinsTraining.com and just email me as well. Hit me up. That's fine if you have any questions. Hmm. And by the way, for anybody who's, you know, whether you're a coach wants to learn about training or just someone wants to learn more about strength training, Steve is super well educated. And I, I will be reading your blog. Hands down. I cannot wait for this because I think the content yeah. on long form articles will be banging from you. Yeah, I think I'm going to put some up. I think I will because it's good for website traffic. <laughs> they get read. <laughs> good, for web, good for website traffic, and it's one of those formats. You take snippets and paragraphs, that becomes your Instagram content. And vice versa. Right? Yep. And vice versa. And then and, and the video content, I'll be start, I'm getting through my backlog of editing, and I'll, I'll help you with that. Wicked. Sweet, man. Right. Sweet. Appreciate it again, mate. I will speak to you next week. It's Enjoy nice. your holiday. Thanks. See you later. Uh,
Thank you very much for watching the podcast. If you're like me and like to binge watch podcast episodes, click here for our most recent episode. And if you enjoy the show and want to be updated when new videos come live, click here to subscribe to the channel.